Hello, everybody. Welcome to our panel on the future of open source, specifically talking about SaaS, what we like to call the final frontier of open source. <laughs> um, we have a great panel for you here today. Um, I've got a couple of housekeeping slides for you, and then I'll introduce the panel. I'm Sarah Guthels, and uh, I lead DevRel here at Century, so I'll be the host for today. All right, here we have our panelists, um, and I'm just going to quickly introduce them, and uh, then I'll talk a little bit about housekeeping, and then we will ask our first question. We're just going to get right into it. Um, so first, we have uh, Yao, and Yao is a startup entrepreneur. Sorry, Yao is the founder and CEO of ODK the offline data collection platform that helps researchers, field teams, and m and &E professionals fight disease, poverty, and inequity. He holds a PhD in computer science and likes to keep his bio short and sweet. We also have Pierre. Pierre is a startup entrepreneur for 10 years and has built both consumer and B2B startups in the past. He did Y Combinator in W19 and sold a marketplace for hiring remote contractors in 2020. While building the marketplace, he discovered the huge need for better open source scheduling infrastructure, sorry, scheduling infrastructure, and ended up building Cal.com. And finally, we have Jared. Jared was the CEO of CodeCov and became head of CodeCov at Century after its acquisition of CodeCov in 2022. Prior to CodeCov, he was the former head of venture at Funders Club, helping grow companies from seed, including GitLab, Coinbase, Instacart, and Flexport. Named one of Forbes 30 Under 30 in 2017, Jared graduated from the Wharton School and currently lives in Amsterdam. So those are your panelists. Um, please feel free to ask questions in the Zoom Q&A. We all have access to it so we can answer there in chat, but also we'll be monitoring it and we will have a live question and answer time. So we'll we'll gather some of those um, for that portion. Also, we will be sending you a recording of this after the webinar is over. Uh, so you will be able to revisit things if, uh, if you missed anything. All right, so I quickly introduced you to each person, um, each one of our panelists, but I'd like them to kind of give a couple of sentences as to who they are and really just answer in maybe 10 words or less. What is open source to you? Maybe mention how long you've been, you know, involved in open source companies or contributing to open source, but really what is open source to you? All right, I'm gonna stop sharing this so that y'all can see us a little bit better. And we'll go ahead and start with Yao. Great, am I muted? Okay, I'm on, great. So hi everybody, I'm Yao. I think Sarah, thanks for having me, everybody. Um, I think Sarah already did a great job of introducing me, so I don't wanna do more than that. Um, I would answer, so I've been doing open source, I checked. Um, for the last 18 years, my first contribution was uh, I built an ADM, uh, which is a chat client, O chat client uh, plugin. And uh, that was 18 years ago. Um, I have been leading ODK and doing open source sort of full time for about 15 years. Uh, so I've been doing it for a long time. Um, open source to me is just a, a, a way to give back and to give forward almost. Um, it's really sort of a, a series of trade offs there. I like that. Give back and give forward. Uh, Pierre, would you like to elaborate and say what open source is to you? Hi, my name is Pierre. Thank you for having me. Um, to be honest, I started my journey into engineering uh, with WordPress. So that was, for me, when I was very young, the entry into web development. And uh, I mean, I don't think I've met a single software developer who has never used any open source technology. It's I think it's very impossible. Just every our entire society is built on open source. And so um, being at the forefront, you know, and being a good uh, role model for, you know, future generations uh, is, is super, super dope. Um, 
but uh, I choose open source because it's just the best way for me to build the product that I'm trying to build, which is um, an open scheduling platform that is, you know, embeddable by others. And um, closed SaaS is just not the right way to uh, to go with the company we're building. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I'm an open source. And uh, to be honest, um, I think it's just the best way to build a company nowadays. Um, I would probably, my next company would also probably be open source. Thank you. Jared. Uh, great. I, I agree with what's been said, but yeah, again, I'm Jared. Uh, I used to lead CodeCov. I still lead CodeCov, but now we're acquired by Sentry. I'm here in Sentry's office in Vienna. This is not my everyday desk setup, but I get to feel like I'm a news anchor for, for the moment, which is fun. Um, Sarah asked this question before, so I prepared a little bit about the 10 words or less. It took me a minute to get it under 10 words, but here's what I got. Uh, Open source is maximally moving software forward while neutralizing bad actors. I don't know. That's the best I could come up with. Um, my journey with open source has been a bit different. CodeCub has been serving open source users for free, always and forever since 2015. But we ourselves were closed source uh, up until just a couple months ago, uh, where we became source available. Um, that was a big step for us. I'm really excited about it. So to talk more about it, but our long-term goal is to become open source. I've also been learning a lot from Yao and Pierre in our conversations. So excited to keep learning as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. I, I really like uh, each of you touched on this and I wonder if we can just open this up to a, a little discussion um, about just diving a little deeper into your version of open source that you're dealing with currently and why this is the time to do it. And I think each of you spoke a little bit about uh, everything is kind of built on it, uh, trying to support kind of the future. I liked the, um, you know, building software, I I'm paraphrasing, but like quickly and reliably while trying to, to get rid of bad actors. Um, I'm going to interject a little bit here. Uh, I would also argue that open source, while also reducing bad actors, could um, introduce diversity of thought and and diversity of kind of who you're serving. Um, I I used to be at GitHub. I I've written GitHub for dummies. I I love kind of the idea of open source from the community perspective as well. So whether you're talking about the software, the business, or the dev community as a whole. Um, just kind of your version of open source, what it means to you and, and and why right now? And I know you each touched on it a little bit in the quick intros, but let's maybe dive a little bit deeper. Does anyone want to start? Otherwise, we'll go with Yao. <laughs> or I, I can jump in. Um, because uh, ODK has sort of been around now for 15 years, um, and in the last years, we've gone through a couple of transitions where we've more... We've always been sort of historically positioned as like a community made or community oriented project. And we've sort of evolved to become more of a single source uh, project, a single vendor. Uh, and this was not a decision that we made lightly. It's it's because um, even though we've always survived, it we just didn't have the resources to continue to make ODK. So it took a lot of hard decisions and we sort of avoided financial collapse. Um, which was great. We did it in a way that it, without ruining the project, we thought a lot of ways about how we could continue to make ODK when we make these initial decisions, like joining a derivative project, starting up a foundation, but ultimately SaaS was the model that aligned best with the problems that we had to solve and, and the future evolution uh, with the project. I'm gonna go a little long and say that we're at a point now where it's amazing, like all the code is open source. Most of our processes are out in the open. We don't really like encourage code contributions, but we have bug reports and use cases and translations and community support and all that feels good. But importantly, like we have a financial engine in the SaaS product that lets us get this recurring revenue. That means we can have like 14 people on the team. Everybody gets paid a good wage. They can think about the long term. Um, because we're in the social impact space, we tend to, uh, we have the option of pursuing grants and we still do that, but it's not something that we have to do now, uh, which is great. Ultimately, it just feels like at this moment in time, open source and SaaS is a big win because like it makes everything about the project, at least our project, the software, the docs, the marketing, everything is just higher quality and it's still open source. Um, and it's not community made anymore, but it never was. You know, it was just like positioned that way. So it ends up being more transparent and, and honest. So 
Um, I, I'll end by saying that like now we're in a position where we have the space to think about what makes a project like this successful and how we can evolve it past you know 15 years to 30 years and, and longer. Um, we try not to be ideological about these kinds of things. We're very practical people trying to build a thing that makes the world a better place. And so open source is part of that better place, but it doesn't help anybody if we can't build the thing. You know, um, and my team doesn't like this quote, but we can't set ourselves on fire to keep other people warm. I always tell the team that. And so when we're making decisions, we want to keep making the thing, but we just can't do it if we don't have the resources to do it. So, yeah, sorry, I went a little off, but. No, no, that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. And we're going to touch on a lot of this um, a little later as well. And this actually relates to one of the Q&A questions we've already gotten, which is kind of the various business models of enterprise open source. And I think. uh uh, you know, a lot of you have touched on this, but uh, Jared, you mentioned being able to serve the open source community, being able to offer CodeCov to open source uh, projects. Um, and Yao, you just mentioned, you know, uh, having like being more authentic and truthful about what part of ODK is open to the community and maybe not necessarily the, uh, you know, pull requests and, and, and code contributions, but the bug reports and the, the planning and having that be open and transparent. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm excited to kind of dive deeper into those, those bits. Uh, Pierre, do you want to talk a little bit about it? I think it's been, I think I need a refresh of the question again. Yeah, um, yeah. Essentially kind of the, like your version of open source and why now at this time? And you talked a little bit about it with cal.com in your in your brief intro, but just kind of diving a little deeper into um, what open source is to, to cal.com to you and 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 why is it critical that it's, it's open source now? I think... Um... I think when you choose a technology, it has to fit the problem and a lot of problems can be solved with open source. Uh, I don't think everything has to be open source. I mean, most things can probably be open source, but not everything has to be open source. But if you are planning to build a product that is targeting either developers or um, compliance industries, healthcare, government, governments, um, financial, anything that people deeply integrate into their product, um, quote unquote, infrastructure. Uh, it's very hard to not be open source, in my opinion, it doesn't give you any benefits. Um, and so I typically like to look at markets and of course, choose the right tool for the problem. I don't think people who go technology first and then try to find the right market uh, are in, in a good position. So I think it always depends on what you're trying to build. Um, there's many products like I'd say Spotify where you have different network effects with like music labels and or, um, or Stripe, which has very good banking relationships, um, which are probably not better open source unless you also build up those, you know, royalty agreements and bank bank licenses. But then again, I'd say an open source Spotify with the same license agreements would probably be better. <laughs> so you could make the argument that that's also true. Um, but uh, yeah, in my opinion, if you want to build a great, great product, you want to be as close as you can to your customers. And being open source means your customers are likely also fixing the bugs that they experience themselves. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that you can't get better than that. Um, and to be uh, involving your your customers or users or um, or partnership like like partners that um, you know other companies that want to work with you, uh, I think it's the best way to be open source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I like this idea that you know you mentioned in your quick intro. Um, you know, there's there's hardly a developer that exists that isn't using something open source or that was you know open source and and to to give back to that. And I really liked that you touched on on market first and community first. What is your community needing? And I think, yeah, you you know the 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 idea of having bug reports and your process and everything open and having the community able to to just kind of discuss that in the open and and know what's going on. Um, and similar to you, Jared, about you know making CodeCub available for open source projects, it it really does I think touch on the let's get as close to the customer as possible, right? Where especially where our customer is a developer, and um, 
yeah, I, I like that there's a common theme, even though you each are approaching it from kind of a different perspective. Uh, let's get as close, get, get as much feedback as quickly as possible from the customer while not expecting them to build our product for us for free, right? <laughs> Jared, do you want to dive a little bit deeper into, into kind of CodeCov and or your general experience? Yeah, I mean, one of the values that we've uh, preached to our to ourselves as CodeCov is this idea of transparency or the burden of proof for the people that know the American legal system in the audience. Like the burden of proof is on proving guilt. To me, the burden of proof is showing why you shouldn't be open, right? Uh, and I think SaaS is a business model or pricing or packaging schema. Open source is a framework. And like, I guess the question I would ask is like, why wouldn't SaaS go the way of kind of every other layer of, of what we built in software and infrastructure, which is eventually getting to that layer of, of uh, open code and open source. Um, so that's one piece. And then, yeah, kind of the why now, I mean, the challenges, you know, we're no longer in like the RMS free software movement versus Xerox. This isn't exactly Linux versus Microsoft, but I think someone in the chat just asked about HashiCorp and Elastic and MongoDB. Like the nature of the challenge to software and the and the growth of software and what it means for our world has changed. Like there's a different type of, I'm not going to say bad actor, but a different type of challenge to, to growth and like how, how software that we write can be used. Um, that requires changes as well. So like, uh, I think it makes sense that, that, SaaS would, would go this way um, as, as the other yeah. side. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I really like that separation of, of, you know, there's kind of the business model and then there's the, how are you actually building something and, and how are you engaging with your customers and community? And, and I love that idea of it's, it's your burden of proof to say why you shouldn't be open source. Um, and I think that kind of answers Andrea's question in the, in the chat of like, the trend of moving to open source, I think it's because we're we're seeing that the community is like, why why are you closing? Why are you not letting us see what's what, what what's here? What, why are you not letting us see the process or or what's under the hood? Um, great. Let's talk a little bit about. You each made an explicit decision to make your software available in in various kind of degrees. I'm curious, what was the biggest benefit to doing this that you were betting on? And as you discuss this, maybe talk a little bit about um, what, like you, you might you might talk about it in framing of like, what were some challenges that you were already facing or, you know, surprise challenges or things like that. But, but what were you really kind of betting on when you made that explicit decision? And we'll go backwards, Jared, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, to us, it was the idea that, I mean, for one, we couldn't come up with a really compelling reason not to, right? Uh, frankly, joining Sentry, which has been source available under BUSL for some time now, helped give us that confidence. Um, but moreover, I just really like the idea, and it has felt great, and this has been the confirmation. When you're talking to a customer or a user, you don't have to say, hey, trust me, we got this. It's not a black or a gray box. You can just show them the issue and show your work, right? Or even better say like, what do you think? Um, are we on the right track? Do you have any feedback, right? Like that is, that has felt really nice and really um, clear and, and transparent. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's been a really good confirmation of the, of the hope that we had. Yeah. Were there any... Um... I know it's been very recent since since CodeCov became source available, but has there already been any surprise benefits or challenges uh, to doing that? Yeah, on both sides. I mean, surprise challenges, like, first off, not every customer is going to be immediately pumped when you open up a closed source code base. They say like, hey, can Black Hat actors like use this against you? Like, are you sure you cleanse this correctly? Um, they... Um, like, you know, you got to make sure you don't leave tokens, example. Um, mm -hmm. Second, like you got to be really confident in your ability to deliver what you say you're going to do, right? There's no hiding behind the clarity and transparency, transparency they have. And like, we were really excited about that, but, you know, it, it's a different level of pressure, which I think is a positive, by the way. Um, just one surprise benefit. Uh, I wasn't anticipating, I wasn't, I was hopeful that we get some contributions and people stepping up to help us, you know, open PRs and right things. And we've gotten that so far, but I was not anticipating was customers answering questions for other customers, right? Yeah. Um, like our power users actually stepping in to kind of like help guide other folks like directly in issues. That was, that was really swell. 
that is really awesome, actually. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Pierre, uh, kind of the explicit decision to decision to be open source. What was the biggest benefit you were betting on? The reason that kind of made you do it, and then anything that was a surprise. Yeah, we started this company from day one in, in the open source space um, because I was actually looking for an open source scheduling product for my previous business, which was a, a hiring marketplace to hire remote contractors. And so I wanted to build whatever scheduling I could find into my existing marketplace and not depend on hosted SaaS products that may or may not go out of business at some point or or are just not like flexible enough. I couldn't, you know, change the code or layout design whatsoever. Um, plus the whole data residency is an, is an issue sometimes. Um, you can't like run queries on your database and everything. So I was just on Google looking for an open source alternative and couldn't find it. Um, and it turns out that that business was a lot more interesting than the hiring marketplace. <laughs> um, and so now I'm here. Uh, well, so technically that explains um, what I was trying to achieve with open source. Yeah. And so now we're powering tons of marketplaces that have the same issues. Yeah. Were there any surprise benefits or challenges that you ran into um, that you weren't expecting? Yeah, people are starting to build the weirdest things um, that we had not anticipated. I mean, I I'd say one of our top users like a like a marketplace to find like barber shops or something. And so it's yeah. like uh, I did not we did not plan to build this for barbers, but here we are. So I think yeah. um, people are a lot more creative when it comes to accessible technology than if it's just like a, you know a SaaS product for. Uh, salespeople it's very rare that someone just picks up a SaaS tool for salespeople and turns it into a barbershop uh, booking platform but with open source I think there's a lot of more creativity around um, just taking something and making a der derivative product and so I think um, that's something we just didn't anticipate so we have like healthcare customers yoga trainers uh, barbershops um, you know financial companies and uh, legal companies using cal.com for scheduling um and i think that's uh it's very interesting because uh yeah we, we didn't plan to go into those markets but the developers came and built it in, in that direction right yeah no that that actually really reminds me of um uh i i did a startup many years ago and i got lucky enough to go through this kind of like small business startup program and through the national science foundation here in the states and um, one thing that they told us was, you know, from the very, very beginning, get out the door and go listen to who you think your customers are and, um, and, and be ready to hear that the product you're thinking or the, the company you're thinking of, of building is not actually what they want. They want something slightly different. And I think what's, what you kind of just touched on Pierre is kind of this idea of by building openly, whether it's an open source, you know, accepting contributions or it's just source available, you know, whatever, whatever the licensing is, whatever the details are, by building openly, you do get that feedback right away and potentially have some other interesting uh, just kind of customers or, or, or completely different um, uh, use cases that you wouldn't have expected. And and I think that kind of just touches on on the idea of 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 the basis of what open source means, it sounds like to all of us, at least here on the call. Uh, yeah, uh, explicit decision to be open source. Explicit decision is a hard sentence. Yeah, to it is. <laughs> um, in, in our, on? Yeah, in, in our case, it wasn't it wasn't super explicit. So the history of ODK was that I was working on my PhD in computer science, and part of that was doing a lot of field work in East Africa. And working with a lot of hospitals and the like, and I had a lot of evidence that suggested that having we're doing like data collection on on uh, J2ME phones and 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 Nokia phones. I just had a lot of evidence that a modern data collection platform could potentially transform global health. So uh, my PhD advisor at the time, he was on sabbatical at Google, and he was saying like, "Hey, I'm at Google. You're talking about this potentially crazy new operating system, mobile operating system called Android. So come." And we'll like when Android launches, we'll build this data collection platform on top of that. We'll make it open source so we can take it back to the university and, and do that. So as academics, it was just like the stuff that we did. It's just like, obviously, you, you build something open source so other people can contribute to it and um, produce something useful. So that was our default. 
Um, we did not know it was going to be a thing. <laughs> it was just supposed to be a small research project. So the challenges, we didn't think of any challenges because we were young and idealistic. Uh, we didn't expect it. it. It was not like an intentional thing in that way. Um, some of the surprises very early on was, you know, for specs, libraries, small like bits of code are like really easy to build a community around and easy places for people to collaborate. A product, you know, something that's end to end, it's just like, a lot harder. Um, and so it led early on to a lot of fragmentation uh, as people needed to like resource uh, the work. Uh, and so people differentiated and it became a real challenge. Um, you know, the biggest challenge, the biggest surprise is always like, you know, people need resources to build software. Like in the early days, like I didn't, I said, I didn't even think about that. It's like somebody needs to be paid to be here to like fix security issues and to provide support and all these kinds of things. And so that was a big um, challenge and it continues to be a big challenge with a lot of open source projects. The biggest benefit is that um, uh, open source, and this may be a question here in the chat, open source becomes sort of like a distribution channel, especially for developer, you know, it's like free marketing and free distribution. Um, and so it gets people, it gets your technology in places where you couldn't reach. And in our case, a lot of our, you know, quote, competitors, people who build derivative products, we're really helping spread the core technology and providing services that we couldn't provide as academic researchers. And so it's a knife that cuts both ways. It spread the technology. We have an Apache 2 license. So it spread the technology far and wide, um, which is great. Um, but it also caused a lot of fragmentation as it spread, which was not so great. And so, um, you know, there are trade-offs, uh, but for, for us, yeah, it wasn't really an explicit decision. It was just like, that's how we do things as researchers. We just make it open source. And uh, now we're sort of trying to find the right balance there. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I'm I'm kind of curious. Um, we're gonna jump into answering some of the questions that were asked in Q and A and and in the chat on, um, kind of the business model. When you would do it? Would you do it? You know, from day zero? Would you do it MVP later? Um, but but I I want to touch on this briefly. Uh, Pierre, you mentioned kind of how you were you were building this and then you didn't expect it to be used in other ways. And that the you know closed source SaaS offerings were not uh, are not likely to be used in those other ways when they're kind of packaged in that way. And yeah, you just kind of touched on the fact that when it's open source, sometimes it gets fragmented and and you know different pieces are used for different things. Um, I, I just kind of want to pose this question back to you all: if you do decide, and and I. I very biased. I think that you should just make the decision from day zero, right? Um, you should, and if you decide later on, that's fine and and great. Welcome to to open source. Welcome to source available. Whatever you choose to do. Um, but but if you decide from day zero, I think it does impact not just who your customers are, what community you're serving, but also how your software develops and whether or not it is kind of this one complete software package or a, a bit more fragmented and can kind of be plug and play. How did, did that play a role at all in, 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 in any of your journeys here? And, and did that affect the business at all? Or is it really just kind of a technical detail? I, I can, I can jump in here really quickly because I think your insights are exactly correct in that, uh, you know, when we started ODK, our vision was like, the ODK used to be called Open Data Kit. It's like a data toolkit that it was going to be like Linux-like and plug and play. And people could write into components, which again, is a fantastic idea for an academic research project. Not so great as like a product that people want to actually use. And so I think if you're, I think it's totally okay to do something on day on day zero, make it open source. I think uh, the folks who are on this call, you should really think about it. You know, like uh, you should be intentional about what you're doing, think about the trade-offs, uh, get your priorities right, and make sure that the decision you're making, whatever you're making, is done in an intentional way. If you do that, you will learn, as Sarah, you sort of suggested that there are places where contributions make a lot of sense and places where contributions don't make a lot of sense. If you build one large monolithic code base, it's going to be very hard for people to contribute to that. If you build a small core, with uh, a plugin architecture that people can contribute, you can get more contributions that way. So it really depends on how you expect the software to be used, where you think people contribute. You know, Homebrew is a great open source project because everyone can contribute their own sort of Ruby scripts that install the apps, and there's not a lot of command and control. Whereas like Firefox is really hard to contribute to because it's an enormous web browser. You know, it's like so. 
if you're intentional about what you're building, how you expect people to use it, how you expect your contributions to come in and you're realistic about that, you can just be more successful um, if you are, you know, planning all that stuff out and making decisions based on that. Yeah. No, it sounds like intentionality is is kind of the key here. It, making the decision on day zero. And someone asked a question in the chat about licensing. We're not going to dive too deep into licensing on this call. We have another webinar in the future that'll talk more about it. But I think the gist of it is you choose your license, you choose your your project structure, you choose whether you are you know accepting PRs or or just bug reports or or whatever it is, whether you are open sourcing the code or or the actual process and planning and all of that. Um, to be, but you choose that intentionally on day zero, right? And and there are many pros and cons to each of those decisions, and it really depends on what impact you're trying to have, what you're trying to build, and and how you anticipate kind of engaging with the community. Jared or, or Pierre, any any other bits on kind of the challenges of choosing day zero and and whether or not it's one big monolith or <laughs> fragmented? Yeah, I mean, just just one thing to add, and Pierre might have something too. Just like the scarcest resource when you're starting something new is is thoughtful feedback from your users like and getting the product market fit is hard as hell and anything you can do to get closer to what the users actually want to use this thing for in my opinion is worth it that's what i wish i had when we were early early days um yeah my take on this is um, if you know you want to be open source, um, you should be vocal about it very early, like uh, just make a website and promote your product. I mean, the, the thing about startups is you can start selling your product before it's ready. And by selling, I mean, make a wait list, uh, make a nice website. There's tons of templates. Tailwind templates or Webflow stuff. It really doesn't cost anything to make a website nowadays. And just clearly explain what you're trying to build and why it's open source and why it's better um, and what it what problem it solves, right? That's what we did or that's what I did back in the days. Um, and that was before, I mean, I had a repo, of course, but I made it private because I wanted to just get some substance in there first. Um, but that way you can launch immediately. I mean, you're basically, what you're looking for is you're attracting a community and you're building something in public, but it doesn't mean uh, you have to have everything public already, but you're still trying to build an open source product. So you're building a community, maybe you're inviting people into a Discord server or a Slack server, that's what we did. So everyone in the waitlist automatically was invited to the, the Slack channel. Um, and then you try to meet up with people and you try to have conversations about the roadmap. Like the day you start, open source doesn't mean you need a fully blown repo, like just having an open Figma file where you just say, hey, this is going to be what I want to build is the day you start with an open source journey, right? As long as you don't go private then. Um, but um, so I, I would always do that um, because that gives you so much more um, insights before you write the first line of code. Coding is yeah. expensive if or time consuming. So if you if you know how to code, it's time consuming. If you don't know how to code, it's going to be expensive as hell to hire someone. And so try to push that as far as you can and, and try to get to some sort of product market fit feeling before. Um and uh yeah, just try to um then launch, you know, the repo when you feel comfortable. And it's probably earlier than you think. Um, like it doesn't have to be perfect. Our repo was we launched it when I'd say like the very bare bone MVP worked. Like it was working, it was crap, but it was working. It was solving a problem, right? Uh, it's a lot easier to launch a product that actually solves an issue on like Hacker News or Product Hunt or somewhat um, than, you know, launching a wait list or launching uh, an unfinished product that doesn't do anything. Um, so that's how we approached it and yeah, Pretty much the very first day we went viral on all platforms and yeah. haven't stopped since then. Um, and so that's how how we've approached this. Um, there's many ways you can do this differently, but that's just something that worked for us. Um, and I would probably do it the same way next time. I I absolutely love that. And that that kind of Jared, you mentioned in the chat answering one of the questions uh, that the risks are not nearly as scary as it might seem. And I love this combination of that with what Pierre just said, which is 
open sourcing from day zero doesn't just mean having every single commit that you do on a daily basis being public, right? Right at the beginning. Um, it's that intentionality of how you're setting up your community, how you're setting up for that thoughtful feedback that you mentioned, Jared, um, and how you are establishing your product and your offering within kind of this, this problem space or solution space for your customers. Um, and, and yeah, I think one thing that I, I, I've taken away from open source projects, you know, my small startup, my grad school as well, yeah, is, is this idea of when people are too afraid to share their ideas, I think sometimes you forget that you've done a lot of work <laughs> to get to the point of having this idea and kind of knowing where you're going to start with the solution. And that work is not easily copyable, right? And so just because you're sharing kind of your process and, and your code or, or whatever part of your um, solution or, or SaaS offering publicly doesn't mean someone can easily just come in and, and copy it. Yes, that, that can be a risk. And that's why we do have licensing and, and various ways of, of adjusting for that. But, um, but yeah, it's not, it's not just like someone will just come in and, and replace you that quickly. Uh, and so I agree that the risk isn't as nearly as scary as it might seem. And that kind of brings us into this idea of business justification. And now you, you talked about this a little bit, you know, at the beginning of, of making sure that you can be like your open source or, you know, offering is, is sustainable, that it, that it can continue to grow, that it can continue to be built. Um, so as we're thinking about like the business yeah. justification, apologies, dogs, um, I'm curious kind of what was the hardest decision that you had to make in justifying this being open and, and, and whatever kind of level it's open for, for each of you? And yeah, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah. Um, so sustainability concerns sort of came years after the project started when we were leaving grad school. Uh, you know, all that stuff was hidden from us in the sense that, you know, advisors get grants, grad students get paid. And so like, well, who cares about sustainability? It's just like us. Um, and, and as that project left the university, we were able to sort of find grants or consulting work that we used to pay for ongoing development. But and it's it was sustainable in the sense that we could always make it work. But it's just like not a sensible way to build software. You know, I, I think of open source software almost like a gardening kind of thing where like there's a lot of maintenance. And, and so like great that you get a grant. But if the grant arrives in winter, like the ground is too hard. You can't do anything with it. So it just doesn't, doesn't make sense. You have to have a predictable process. And so uh, for me, uh, ODK became this like, like a beautiful thing that um, was pretty much used, is pretty much used exclusively to do good things. And that's the kind community. It's like, its impact has been super incredible. It's the app that eradicated wad polio from Africa. Like the Red Cross uses it for every humanitarian disaster. Uh, the Carter Center uses it for election monitoring. And so it was just like, how can we let this thing die? It just, it's crazy to try to let it die. So it was very easy to say, it's like, we need to find some way to make money so we can keep doing this thing that everybody enjoys and allows us to sort of thoughtfully, you know, evolve the project or that project goes away. So it was a very easy decision. The challenge was really like, how do we make the decision in a way that doesn't ruin the thing that everybody likes? Uh, and so we've been very fortunate in the sense that our community trusts us to make those kinds of decisions and, you know, it's difficult decisions along the way, but um, we're now sort of in a good place because we have the SaaS to pay for stuff. Um, it seems obvious now, right? It's like, obviously you would need something to pay for the stuff, um, but it took us a long time to get to that point to make that decision. Makes sense. Pierre, what about you? What were some of the business justifications and how to to be sustainably successful uh, while remaining open for you? I think when it comes to fears of getting like forked or people copying your code whatsoever, um, in my opinion, code is really a commodity. And if someone wants to, I mean, look at Facebook copying Snapchat or Instagram, uh, taking over stories like, any decent engineer can crank out a, a feature in a month, like whatever feature you're launching. Uh, if you're afraid of someone taking your code and being better than you, then you have a shitty engineering team because you need to keep being better than whatever who's you're working with. And so for me, 
like the code is not really a, I mean, it is technically an asset, but like we don't really see it as an asset in our balance sheet. And so what we did is um, we were, when we had first signs of product market fit and I highly agree, highly recommend doing this, we started, at, well, I highly recommend not doing venture funding if you don't have that signs of product market fit because that's another tricky situation. But we were very confident in our ability to build a big business with this uh, project that we have at our hands. And so we ended up raising a pretty decent seed round um, and uh, put uh, a good chunk um, into having just a very good domain and branding and um, really try to put our X in everything that's not code, right? Um, because I think if you have a community, if you have a good brand and if you have a good reputation and very good developer velocity, you know, your team just really, really ships there's no point to fork you if the core team is doing great stuff, right? Um, I think we see this over and over again where, you know, the fork just dies because there's no company behind it. There's no conviction. There's no uh, community. Um, you can fork a code base, but you can't fork the user base. You can't fork the brand. Um, and so if, if you have a mindset of, you know, code is not the thing you should be protecting at all costs, you start to you know, build your moat, your, you know, business mode in other parts. Um, and this even goes as far as licensing. Like I, we're not afraid, we're not changing plans. We don't have plans to change to a more permissive license anytime soon, because we just really think people want to have a Calicom link because it's the shortest and the best in, in the industry. I'm not afraid of any business doing like easy scheduling.biz as a user, like as a link, it's just not going to happen. And so, um, yeah, we are not really afraid of anyone taking our code and doing something with it that we are not happy with. Um, you know, if you know the recipe of Coca-Cola, you're not gonna compete with Coca-Cola. It's the distribution, it's the partners, it's the the, the brand recognition, right? So um, I, I really don't think that way. I mean, there are yeah. certain things that you should be cautious to put out in the public. Uh, I think this is more important when it comes to AI and stuff. But um, if you're building a SaaS product, your code is not valuable. What you do with it is, which is brand and partners and network effects and user base and reputation. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, just to plus one that um, I did my my grad work at University of California, San Diego, and during grad school built a video game that taught kids to code through magic. And it was like a 3D immersive game and uh, started my company while in grad school. And we were going to bring that over to the company. And so we went through all of the legal, you know, lawyer, all of the lawyers at the university, which, you know, are very <laughs> detailed lawyers. And they concluded that the code is not, did not have a patentable algorithm. So we could take it and do whatever we wanted and sell it or do whatever we wanted with it. For that exact reason that that Pierre was just mentioning, right? The code itself was not complicated. It was it was the ideas kind of behind it and and how we were approaching it, and we had to be careful with that. But um, even very <laughs> very aggressive university lawyers <laughs> agree. <laughs> uh, Jared, any anything um, uh, that you want to add on kind of the business justification of of making Code Cove source available? Yeah, I mean, I think Pierre really nailed it. Um, like. First mover advantage, great ideas, great engineering teams are not sustainable differentiation. There's only really four. I'll, I'll lean in my experience as an economist here. One is network effect, like, like what Facebook has. The next is economies of scale. You can produce it cheaper. Well, code is very cheap to produce. The third is brand, like what, I don't know, Dolce & Gabbana has or something. And um, and the fourth is trade secrets, patents. And practically speaking, almost no SaaS company gets patents. Like it takes too long. So you, you don't have any of those at your disposal, right? Um, so you, it seems like a lot of the people on this call are operators or considering starting companies. So you just have to be faster, right? And if you're not going to get the benefit of a closed source, closed source code base, then might as, we might as well get the benefit of the open one, right? Um, and like, practically, even if your code is, is closed, like as Pierre said, it's just not that hard to figure out or to kind of imitate what's what's happening or have a team build it. Um, I mean, one of our biggest competitors as CodeGov is build versus buy, which brings me to my second point that hasn't been brought up that I think is one of the main people push back against uh, an open source or source available cloud tool, which is 
well, then why will customers pay you for it, right? I'm creating value. Am I going to be able to capture the value that I'm creating? And on that point, I get it. Like, I get why that's a concern. But frankly, like, let me just kind of step into a conversation. Like, one of our biggest customers is Lyft, right? When, when we were selling to Lyft CodeCov, even, even as a source available tool, um, they were deciding to build something themselves or use CodeCov or, or host it themselves or use CodeCov. And the question, if you put yourself in the big company shoes, um, the question is always, is it the most effective thing to have our engineers hosting this tool, uh, building X tool, right? Versus trying to go do the most differentiated thing that we can do as Lyft, which is build the world-class like, you know, ride sharing solution, right? And so it's like, you might say like, well, and, and like developers love like going for free, right? To go grab things, but that also isn't a bad thing, right? For anyone who's lived in a big company scenario before, getting through procurement, legal, and security is horrible. It is horrible. And nothing stops a, a potential customer discovering the product value of your tool, like having to go through that just to test it. How much sweeter is it when that customer can just fork your tool, run it, make sure it's like, oh yeah, this is the thing that we wanted, right? And then they can go to their security and legal and procurement teams and be like, hey, we really should push for this, right? That happens all the time. So um, it's a bit scary. For sure, but I think I think it actually again the the benefits way outweigh the costs. I'd say to add to that, we have a lot of customers who do their technical due diligence before we have a sales call with them, right? Exactly. So they take a look at the code base, they took a look at like reports and bugs and you know known issues or or vulnerability reports and and they or or even the stack like is this something we feel comfortable maintaining, right? Like is this written in TypeScript or is this some some uh, crazy like programming language no one in our team like knows right so um this is like this is a huge argument to be open source and like having like this this one person in a company kind of like being aware of this product and kind of like using it already in a private setting or somewhat and then you know having them be the champion for procurement right uh and and champion it inside the company it's it's a huge it's it, we see this all the time uh, the second thing I want to say is um, the people who end up abusing your license, right? Like who who uh, maybe even taking your your permissive code base and don't pay you, right? Like even if you have a permissive code base, you can you can still take it and illegally run it. Um, those are the people who you would never have as a SaaS business anyway. Like you would never target these people. Maybe it's a small indie dev shop. Maybe it's a hobby dev who doesn't know shit about licenses, right? But they would never sign up for your SaaS product in the first place. The people who do sign up for your SaaS product are legally required to comply with their license. And not only okay. that, but they also in most times are legally required to buy a support plan, right? So if you, if you have SOC 2 compliance or any other compliance frameworks, you have to have a support plan for the technology you're using from third-party vendors, right? So that's where open source companies come in, where you basically get the code base, of course, but you still need to buy, like buy a support retainer and, and integration work and and uh, you know API support and stuff. And so, it doesn't make a difference if you're open source or closed source. Um, the company still legally has to, you know engage in the commercial settings. We've never talked to a, a larger enterprise that was like, oh yeah, this is great, but I think we're going with the open core now because you know we fully know what's happening and everything's easy and simple and everything works out of out of the box. That just never happens. And they also don't want to spend the time as as Garrett said. Yeah. It's like it's not a good time of their engineering team to figure out all the ins and outs that our team already knows. Yeah. And I think it, it kind of just to reiterate what you said before, Pierre, which is if if people are not willing to pay for your product or your software, or whatever it is that you're offering, you're probably not selling the right thing or at the right price or to the right people, right? So it, it's not really an issue of, of whether or not it's free. It's more of an issue of are you providing value? Um, we have just about 10 minutes left. Uh, I want to encourage folks to ask more questions either in the chat or the Q&A. Um, there was another question in the Q&A about open source versus source available. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will have another session that's more about licensing and kind of the nuances of those terms. Uh, so look out for that. Um, but as people are thinking about their questions uh, to add to the chat or the q and I'm curious, would each of you start another open source project? If not, 
why? And if so, are there any adjustments to your approach that you would make for your next one? No timeline. I'm not asking you to do it tomorrow. Promise. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I don't think I would probably not. I think, um, uh, ODK has been an, an extraordinary joy and privilege, um, uh, to start and lead and run. And it takes up a, you know, it's like a lot, uh, to do and open source has been, you know, a knife that cuts both ways. So probably not, but I think it really depends. Um, I think if it's like a small form processes and library or like a library, that's like a natural developer tool, I would probably make it open source. But if it's like an end to end product, um, probably not, I would, you know, I, I would have to think really hard about it. But either way, I would say I'd, I'd think a lot more carefully about what I was doing and why things were being open sourced and, and how I'd resource development. Uh, really, I think at this point, I'm probably done with software development as a concept anyway. Like if I'm starting anything else, is it like a motorcycle repair shop or a small, I don't know, farm <laughs> or something? Farm. Yeah, a little small. farm. Yeah, so I'm I'm just done. Like I feel like I I I I was very successful with ODK. I don't need another software project on my yeah. hands. Yeah, I, you know, farming would be good at this point. Woodworking, I think, is very popular for former software developers. That's so. that's what I've started doing. Woodworking. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, a small library, yes. A large sort of complex product, probably not. Or if I think really carefully about like where the the bits of the open source uh, pieces would be. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. And, and like you mentioned, this started at, you know, as a grad school project and you know a lot more now about that. And I think the the one of the biggest takeaways that we've had from this discussion so far is when you have that initial idea, be very intentional about every choice that you're making. Um, so I think that's a very fair answer. Uh, Pierre. I'd probably say the opposite. I would probably, if I don't want to code, I would probably not launch a library in the open because they are really hard to monetize and hard to maintain and uh, and people are freaking rude. Like if you don't have a high value, like if it's just a super tiny library that like converts whatever a number to something else, uh, it's really, really hard time to keep maintaining it um, because I mean, unless you do it really as a hobby. I'm I'm an entrepreneur. I have other hobbies. My hobbies are not tech, right? So I prefer to spend my time outside than than maintaining some Yankee ass small. I I, I appreciate everyone doing that. It's just not my hobby. Um, from a business point of view, I would probably keep all my future projects uh, open source. Um, just out of those uh, huge benefits mentioned earlier. Um, but I also really like B2B and B2B enterprise. And so that's where open source is a little bit better than like building the next clubhouse. I don't know if that's has yeah. to be open source or not. Um, could be, could be better. I mean, it could be interesting to have like an open source Snapchat or open source Twitter. I mean, technically we deserve that. Um, so uh, yeah, no, I, I definitely, I mean, I have already post Cal.com started two new open source projects. Um, so yeah, definitely keep going. Yeah, I think that's something that often gets um, for folks who haven't started or led in early days, large open source projects don't always take into account is how difficult engaging with the community can be at the very beginning, because you're kind of discovering who your, your biggest community contributors are and how they want to contribute. You're discovering how you're going to sustain the development of this and maintain it. And those all of those decisions can can be rough and there can be emotions attached to them and there can be this like you know keyboard warrior mentality um because everything is just kind of done over repositories so i think it can be that's part of why i wanted to ask this question is it's not just kind of would you want to have the same thing that you have today because today was built off of you know years decades of work um but start from the beginning and and there's a lot <laughs> to consider there. <laughs> Jared, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, first off, uh, thank you, New Century uh, parent company. I will not be leaving anytime soon, for the record. Uh, but if I were to leave at some point, uh, yeah, I mean, to the extent that I stay in DevTools, which I think is likely at some point in the future, like, 
when you work in the dev tool, especially like the membrane between you as the builder and the user is so thin. It's like the Spider-Man meme pointing at each other. And so like, I think, uh, I think going open source makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, I'm going to skip over the question of, of DAOs. Um, Jared, I think gave a good answer to that. So feel free to read it in the chat. Uh, there is one question I want to ask um, before we end here, and then I'll ask you each to give kind of one actionable tip for developers as we close it out. Um, but David in the chat asked, is there potentially more value in keeping your main SaaS product proprietary, but creating open source communities for large libraries and frameworks in your product, as Basecamp has done with Ruby on Rails, Turbo, and Stimulus.js? Anyone? I mean, we've kind of talked honestly, about this. Honestly, hey.com has so many rough edges. And it, if it, I used it uh, very, very early and it's still not better. And if it was open source, I would have just gone in and fixed those sh like stuff. Like it's so many rough edges and so much of the product. I just like spend a day and fix it myself. I churn from hey, so I would probably still be a customer and would probably be the biggest email client in open source today. So I think I really like missed out on that. Um, so sucks for them. It's a great domain though. Yeah, I, I would just add, it's just like, it's just a very slippery slope, right? Like I've had in these conversations where you're like, well, this one enterprise feature, that's the real money maker. Like we can never open source that. And it's just like, but where do you, where do you draw the line? I guess it becomes the question. And like, how do you, like, how do you have a unifying framework that you can motivate the team around too, right? And explain to them the decision-making consistently and indefinitely and your community, of course, as well. I, I don't know. Like I, I don't. I I know there are open core companies that have been really successfully open core. I think you, if you were going to go that approach, which I think makes sense, and like a GitLab for example, just be really mind mindful and clear to your community from day one what the what that framework is, like where the line is drawn and what's going on either side of it, and so that you can kind of point back to it in the future when, especially when things get hard. Yeah, plus one on that. Awesome. All right. We're going to do a quick, rapid, uh, one actionable tip for developers who are interested in contributing or leading open source software. Yeah, we'll start with you. Yeah, for leaders, I, you've said a million times, just be intentional, be aware of the trade-offs. Um, I do have one thing for contributors is to, to be kind and be helpful. Um, uh, I think somebody told me like free contributions are kind of like free puppies. You know, it's kind of fun at first and then, you know, then there's poop everywhere. So just be kind, be he be helpful. A PR without a test is not helpful. It's not being kind. You're just wasting people's time. So yeah, I'll end it there. I like that. Pierre? Um, I don't know if this is open source specific, but like um, just because your open source repo like has some traction doesn't mean it's a good business. Um, there's many, you know, uh, many libraries out there, as I mentioned earlier, that have, um, you know, high traction and then people are going out and raising venture funding and then they realize it's really, really, really hard to capture value. Um, and then you raise not enough funding and then you run out of funding because it's really also really hard to capture uh, revenue early on. Typically open source startups start to capture uh, revenue in the later stages of their uh, product market fit journey. And so, yeah, be very careful just because you may have struck lightning in the bottle and your GitHub repo trends a couple of days or somewhat doesn't mean it's a multi-billion dollar business in front of you. I've seen this unfortunately a couple of times now in the past two years and it's heartbreaking. Like it's, yeah, I mean, I just recently, I mean, that that was a different reason, but like, I think Rome shut shut down. It's it's an open source fork now. It's like a JavaScript uh, toolkit. Um, they they probably had other reasons, but yeah, not every open source project is is uh, on a VC path. But hey, again, I mean, there's many ways you can be success, successful in open source. You don't need to raise funding. You can also bootstrap or have it be a marketing funnel uh, or something else. So yeah, but when it comes to venture funding, not every like the very very few projects can actually uh, benefit from venture funding. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Jerry. we, we were. Yeah, we weren't uh, open source or source available in the beginning, but it took us five years of bootstrapping before we raised venture. Um, I, I promise I was going to say this before Yao said it, but yeah, just like not everyone's going to be the first code writer of a project. I was not the first code writer of CodeCup, for example. Like you can still make a huge impact being a contributor to a project uh, as it goes. Uh, and this is biased, but like don't be hurt. Like if your contrib contribution doesn't make it in right away, 
And in my opinion, one of the best ways to learn a code base and to contribute is writing tests. Because like some of these really fundamental <laughs> libraries that we use <laughs> are not super well tested and we have the data. Um, so yeah. you learn the code, write tests, people tend to accept them. It's a great way to uh, start contributing. A plus one tests and docs. <laughs> docs also, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Gary Yao and Jared, for this engaging conversation. Thank you, everyone, for um, asking insightful questions. Keep a lookout for the email recording. And if you're watching this on any other platform, we'll have some links down below in the description for where you can learn more. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you.